Ladies and gentlemen, so uh, we're going to start the session now. Welcome to the Zimmer Symposium um, entitled A Clear Vision with a Low Energy Laser. My name is Shari Awad, and I'm moderating the session. We are fortunate to have a distinguished roster of speakers. Some of them are physical with us. Some of them are online, but will be present online for the Q&A as well. Without further ado, we're going to start with the first talk by Professor Mohammed Husni from Egypt, who's going to talk about the Z8 as a game changer. Mohammed. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mohammed Husni. I'm a professor at Cairo University, Egypt. This is just a quick talk, a very rapid talk as an icebreaker for this session about what I do like, uh, why do I, li I like my Z8. So where do I come from? We did uh, my first fem to second assisted surgery in 2012. For some reason, fem to second lasers took a long time to be initiated in, in my country. But when I started, I never looked back, shifted totally in LASIK and corneal transplants. First with the interlace, master soft docking, and became very familiar with PKs with different wound architectures. And I was totally into the technology, so I con convinced the board of the hospital that I work in uh, to buy a FEM2 laser. They bought two, but two different uh, platforms than the Zimmer. We perform a large amount of coronary transplants, uh, both in private patients and health insurance cases. We are a group of three surgeons, three corneal surgeons. I only do transplants with the FEMTO ever since 2012. Over the past 10 years, we have performed hundreds of cases, different designs, and different lamellar techniques. We are strong believers that fem to second laser in cornea transplants um, give you much better results, lower astigmatism, much better wound architecture and wound healing. And we have published a, a few papers on different uh, techniques and different architectures and different scenarios, whether in, in uh, infected, cornea, infected corneas uh, or in um, fem to second assisted DSEC. Again, in anterior lamellar keratoplasty. So how did the Z8, how did the Zemer up my game in penetrating keratoplasties? The mobility of the machine, and it is in the same place, this is a real gem. This is something that when presenters or when the company tells you about it, uh, you, you sort of underrate this uh, um, advantage. But when you use the machine, and when you're used to using femtosecond lasers in other rooms, in, in some hospitals, it's in another floor. In some hospitals, it's across the road. So if you're doing a penetrating keratoplasty and cutting the patient, and then uh, transporting the patient from one room to the other, this is really challenging and you have to train all the staff that you're working with, and you have to do some uh, offsetting from the anterior surface of the cornea to avoid opening the anterior chamber. When you have the, 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 the machine sitting right next to you, this is a real gem if you're doing penetrating keratoplasties. Um, for me, this was a game changer. We had this 70 micron anterior offset technique that we preached in, in many presentations. I don't need it anymore. I can open the anterior chamber very easily as if I'm using a manual trefine. In DALC, we use the Z8, and we do a lot of DALC surgeries uh, from where I come from. We have uh, a huge population of keratoconic patients. And the Z8 is very versatile. It gives you many options, one of which is the tunnel creation. It's very handy. It goes as deep as you allowed under the OCT imaging, direct imaging, provides a side cut architecture like uh, um, a mushroom keratoplasty. So it, it is always handy, and you can actually go very deep near to the desmids membrane, separate the desmids membrane with the big bubble very reproducibly. The Z8 has the software capability of creating the narrow tunnel. The idea is to avoid sharp instruments that can perforate the Desmet's membrane and guarantees uh, the creation of the big bubble each and every time. And it gives you and it tells you if you're going to do a side cut only, a side cut with the lamellar cut, or a side cut, lamellar cut, and a tunnel, you can choose any combination uh, that you want. Okay, and these are just videos of how we do the tunnel and how we plan it uh, on the paste. In in corneal rings, intracorneal rings, again, as I told you, we do have a large population of keratoconus patients, and we sort of mix and match treatments for them according to the severity and according to each case. We use a lot of, of uh, intracorneal rings, and for the first time doing a fem 2 cornea 
uh, intracornea ring, you can actually place the rings at different levels inside the cornea according to the cornea that you're treating. We all do intracornea rings, and when you're doing intracornea rings, you're always handica handicapped by the fact that you're putting the ring 80% depth of the thinnest part of the cornea. That means in thicker parts of the cornea, the, th the ring will be a little bit superficial, and this is something that you can avoid if you're using the Z8. You can do multi-leveling thing, and it's really, really handy, and it gives very good results post-operatively. And this is, this is just an example of the, uh, uh, the screen of the machine where one um, ring is put in two, 250 microns depth, the other one is 300 depth. We have, uh, again, um, published a few um, uh, papers regarding uh, implanting intra, um, intracornea rings with the Z8. Um, as for cataract surgery, um, in 2013, we purchased our first um, uh, FEM2 cataract surgery, and we did, it was the hype at the time, everyone was doing FEM2 cataracts, and I did over 100 cases, and then I stopped. I, I'm not a believer, I wasn't a believer in cataract surgery do it with the FEM2 laser. The turnover time transforms medium-sized list to a full day work. Bubbles make you tiptoe, when you, especially when you're doing hydro dissection. We had all sorts of new techniques to learn to avoid this bubble rupturing the Pussy capsule. Horror stories always, you, you hear about them, uh, about laser overshoot that opens the Pussy capsule. The main incision on the side ports do not usually open that well. And the only patient that has a, a, core, a, a conjunctival edema and sometimes a subconjunctival hemorrhage is the patient that did uh, the femtosecond laser during a, a whole list of normal phacos. So I'm, I stood on podia like today and defending uh, good old FACO against femtosecond uh, laser assisted cataract surgery in many occasions, actually in, in many debates uh, against people who uh, supported uh, FLAX. So I was a FLAX non-believer. Until uh, we acquired the Z8, I just wanted to experiment and, and to see what's going on with this machine regarding cataract surgery. And the first three weeks we did nine cases. Uh, the first couple was to explore the capabilities of the machines. I was really impressed. We had no bubbles because of the low energy. Um, easy, good old hydro dissection. Primary incision and side ports opened consistently. It was just next door, next to the, um, to the FACO machine under the same microscope. So it was no hassle at all. It did not hinder uh, your list. You didn't have capsule bags, tags. And over and above, it was in the same room. So in the, in the Z8, changed me from an unbeliever to almost a disciple of FLAX. Finally, in LASIK, it provided me with all the options I'm used to as inverted side cut, um, lepto LASIK or thin flap LASIK, oval flaps, and it really stands out as you can uh, perform very neat 100 micron flaps, unlike other FEMTO machines where you get uh, vertical gas breakthrough if you go below 110. So again, these are just samples of the, um, uh, the screen. So I think in conclusion, I found in our practice that the Z8 to be an excellent addition to our OR. Its mobility, same setting capabilities came very handy. It is a super accurate laser in performing complex keratoplasty shapes. It really stands out in uh, corner rings, and for me it made, me, it made a total lift, face lift to fem to second uh, cataract surgery. Um, against com competitors, I always say this, uh, there's like, um, I'm a biker, if, if, you're, if you're used to motorcycle running, then you, ha you know there are motorcycles for off-road, there are motorcycles for touring, there are motorcycles for uh, suburban or in-city in uh, driving. The Z8 can do everything and you really don't feel uh, the need to get another machine. And the, the support from Zemer is really unparalleled. They travel all the way from one continent to another if you have a simple question. So thank you so much. Thank you, Professor Hasni, for sharing your ex experience and your journey with the Zimir Z8. Um, the next speaker is actually Professor uh, Sumpai Chi from uh, Singapore. She couldn't make it. However, she's present online, and we're going to play her presentation. Thank you for giving me this opportunity, and I'll be speaking on difficult cataract cases and a new patient interface. These are my financial disclosures. Using the Z8 patient interface to treat the cataract in these Asian eyes can be challenging. 
Docking the patient with a wide palpable aperture using the original Zima patient interface is easy. However, if the patient has a small palpable aperture and puffy eyelids, you can see that docking is difficult because of the contact between the interface and the eyelids. And if the patient has got a sunken narrow orbit and high cheekbones, it's sometimes impossible to dock such a patient. Recently, Zima introduced the Slim Pack. You can compare the new with the old interface, and you will notice, especially from the side profile, that the new is much slimmer than the old, and the outer diameter has been reduced from 20 to 19 mm. The difference is obvious. We are now docking the patient with a tight palpable aperture and after placing on the patient interface and applying vacuum, filling the interface with saline and applying the handpiece, you can now see that there is space between the new slim interface and the eyelid above and below. So it's important that we use a Miyoshi speculum in these uh, small palpable apertures as it helps to create more space. And despite using the speculum, you can see the marks on the eyelid after the treatment. From these photos here, you can see that the new slim pack patient interface gives better eyelid clearance when docked. Let's have a look at some challenging cases now. Capsulorexis in an intumescent cataract can be challenging because of the risk of a capsulorexis runout. Here, the Z8 has done a perfect capsulotomy, which is free-floating. We have attempted fragmentation in this case, which was effective even in the presence of a white nucleus. And this is important because we are able to merely separate the pieces without having to impale the nucleus, which can be dangerous when we do not know how thick this cataract is, and we may inadvertently impale right to the posterior capsule and create a capsule rupture. So after doing a cortical cleanup, we insert a capsule tension ring, as this case had loose zonules, and insert the lens safely in the bag. This is a large posterior polar cataract in a young patient. We know of the increased risk of posterior capsule rupture in these eyes. So after creating a capsulotomy, I'm then truffing. The capsulotomy is 5 mm centered and round in case I have a capsule rupture. It's extremely useful for supporting the ROL. And you can see now that I am beginning to crack this uh, cataract into four uh, segments and I'm able to tumble out each piece without rotating the nucleus. The offset for the posterior from the posterior capsule is unchanged, and the bubbles in the posterior layer help to uh, pneumo dissect free the nucleus posteriorly. So after removing the nucleus uh, bit by bit carefully, I'm then going to remove the epinucleus, and you can see this last fragment is perhaps the most difficult. Uh, but you can see it can easily be tumbled out and leaving the epinucleus intact. And at this stage, I know I'm not going to drop the nucleus and I need to be very careful so that the epinucleus is removed carefully from pos the posterior capsule without ripping the thin capsule. And you can see this is very uh, carefully and slowly done in a controlled manner with the phaco tip and at this stage I stop inject viscoelastic into the anterior chamber before removing my instruments and I then remove the cortex carefully stripping slowly from the periphery towards the center and we are able to do this successfully without losing the posterior capsule in integrity and after implanting a toric lens I remove the viscoelastic from behind and remove my instruments after sealing the incisions. This is my final video, which I call the mother of all cataracts. You can see a small pupil, diffusely loose zonules, and the area of uh, subcapsular fibrosis, which is holding the capsule, which was actually completely cut in this area. And this area of capsule was not completely cut which I could see easily because I stained the capsule. And you can see now a very dense brunescent cataract. I expand the pupil after injecting viscoelastic under the pupil edge and inject the malugan ring into the space, taking care that the scrolls do not latch on inadvertently to the uh, capsulorexis rim. Instead, I then start impaling this very dense nucleus 
and do a horizontal crack along the uh, fragmentation plane. This has been fragmented into octants. I then try to crack along the crack um, fragmentation plane of the femtosecond laser and that was not very deep because I did not impale deeply enough. I then rotate the nucleus to get the next fragment impaling more deeply and then this enables me to separate the pieces more deeply. This is still not down to the posterior capsule. I then rotate the nucleus again to try to go deeper in impaling and separation. But you will see that I have greater and greater difficulty in rotating this nucleus. And therefore, my uh, separation is not very effective. And I am struggling now really to rotate this nucleus. And so I impale on this next area, the fragment, to try to use that to rotate the nucleus instead and then try to one more time separate the uh, fragments and this is more effective this time. But now when I try to rotate the nucleus again, you, you will see that really I am not moving. I remove my instruments, uh, side pot and, uh, instrument and then inject dispersive viscoelastic before coming out, inject a capsule tension ring into the space created just under the capsule um, and above the nucleus, I then inject, I then insert iris hooks to support the interior capsule room. This is time of COVID, and therefore we have no stock of capsular back hooks available at this time, but the iris hooks are effective in providing the counter traction that allow me to rotate the nucleus uh, effectively. And also the capsular tension ring is effective in expanding the capsular back and holding it open and I'm able to completely uh, fake up the nucleus and remove the epinucleus and inject dispersive viscoelastic before I remove my instruments, inject the OL into the capsular bag. Now I remove my devices and as I do that, you will see that the area of the capsule fibrosis here uh, has the rexus that's slightly uh, collapsed and, and therefore I'm going to support this area uh, with the addition of a capsule tension segment, which has been loaded with Cortex 7O after creating a suture snare by create, uh, treading a 27 gauge needle with the Cortex 7O. I then mark 2mm posterior to the limbus, create a Hoffman pocket, at least two uh, half thickness depth to this 2mm mark. I use the suture snare to introduce a loop of suture which is extended to lasso the end of the um, suture loaded on the capsule tension segment and this is then repeated for the other end of the suture and both sutures are then retrieved from the Hoffman pocket and then we tie a, throw a 211 knot of appropriate tension to center the entire OL and this is um, then finalize with two other throws and the knot placed within the Hoffman pocket and the OL centered. Finally, remove the specific scholastic and seal the incisions. In summary, the new slim patient interface enables the docking of eyes with small palpable aperture and puffy eyelids. Surgery for challenging cases such as intumescent, posterior polar, and brunescent cataracts, often associated with capsular fibrosis, weak zonules, and small pupils, is made easier and safer with the Z8 femtosecond laser. Thank you very much for your attention. Impressive um, acrobatic surgeries by Professor Chi using the slim interface of the Z8. Our next speaker is Professor Wolfgang Meyer from Germany. He's going to talk about uh, lamellar keratoplasty techniques using the Z8. Thank you very much for the invitation. These are my financial disclosures. I want to start my presentation just so showing you the starting screen of the CMOT ZL laser because what you've seen here is uh, the surgical toolbox you have with this kind of laser machine. I've never seen this with other platforms uh, where you can such have the surgical indications for doing uh, laser assisted surgery. So going for this, this is a really nice platform uh, going through refractive therapeutic and cataract uh, indications. 
My focus is on lamellar uh, keratoplasty techniques. You see an overview I want to talk on just in an overview. Uh, the DLK, DMAC, Bauman layer transplantation, and of course we will hear it later from Shady talking about cures. Uh, I go through this really fast. First, DLK. We know the indications for DLK, advanced keratoconus, stromal dystrophies, scars with preserving the endothelium, and what is nice here, as you heard it from Shady, that uh, with the OCT guidance, you can easily plan uh, for the big bubble separation, the tunnel informing the, the, the air inside the stroma. That can be easily done uh, pre-op the surgery. You see this here in our OR on the, on the video screen uh, for doing such a surgery. And it's just assisted by one nurse uh, doing all these treatment steps. So really nice and give you more chance to perform DLQ very well. So what, what are the advantages using the laser uh, just for, for, for the DLQ? We have the visualization of the tissue depth with a planning, better planning of the uh, cutting depth. Uh, of course, the OCT guide, the tunnel for big bubble separation. And uh, you know that a stroma up to 70 microns, residual stroma can be to tolerated for good function. So that can be no hint for doing that with the laser. You have an individual treatment profile for each patient and a low conversation rate to the penetrating one. Uh, no increased endothelial cellulose, of course, compared to the manual approach and also the refractive outcomes, as shown in some studies, are uh, equal or better uh, compared to the manual uh, surgery. So that's an advantage because the surgery gets more and more reproducibility uh, in time when you uh, do it this with the femtosecond laser. Next, Bauman layer transplantation. You heard this is a, a, some kind of a new procedure Malice in this group introduced uh, used before for advanced keratoconus. You see this here for the indication to stabilize keratoconus with a minimum of 400 microns, but also for post-refractive scars or assessment nodes uh, to topographic uh, regulate the cornea to enhance and improve the contact lens wearing tolerance. Of course, maybe the visual acuity improvement uh, and uh, the technique is a stromal pocket uh, in the deep uh, stromal area where I implant the Bauman layer. And uh, I don't know who of you do this procedure. It's very difficult to prepare the tissue from the donor and the laser can help here uh, to create a, a right pocket with a standardized diameter and a, a thickness of the Bauman layer uh, tissue with a minimum of uh, 40 microns. That's very uh, easily seen this here on the video. Thanks to my colleague, uh, Dr. Kayat, he's performing the surgery with, uh, very often. This is a video from him I found on YouTube and uh, the group from Mellis who has shown the stabilization over five years doing this Bauman layer transplantation. Should we have other options now for, uh, uh, for the keratoconus or other techniques for um, going through uh, keratoconic or cutacea eyes uh, to prevent uh, them from completely penetrating keratoplasty. Next, DMAC. Uh, as you know, uh, DMAC is one of the most performed keratoplasty techniques worldwide. Uh, it's for bullous keratopathy or the Fuchs uh, disease. Uh, where we just removed the decimate rexis uh, to keep the endothelial stromal cells alive with a uh, donor lamella. Um, what's the indication for laser? Uh, we're thinking about this quite often, and uh, we've seen that we perform a, a standardized decimate rexis with the laser. We achieve more or better outcomes uh, by no overlaps with the donor lamella, and we have no significant gap uh, between the uh, recipient uh, uh, endothelium. And that maybe can be discussed as a benefit for re the rebubbling rate because there's no really detachment of the uh, donor lamella uh, after surgery. Of course, the uh, edema reduction goes faster and this may be an outcome for the endocetal cell survival. So maybe that's an option in the future, um, putting the femtosecond laser also in this region, performing decimate rexis. And some groups are working also in, on decimate stripping only technique, where we just remove the central decimate, uh, removing the gutta, and let the peripheral endocetal cells to migrate, maybe under the influence from uh, rock inhibitors. We've done some studies on that too, to remove just the central part of the uh, 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 decimate area with a specific uh, pattern. You see this here like a stamp pattern where we have some bridges between the, between the cutting area to let the peripheral uh, endothelial cells migrate. You see this here in the scanning uh, electron microscopy photo 
you let the uh, peripheral cells migrate to the central part, that needs some time, but uh, you know, a decimatorexis in the central part, uh, doing it manually is very tricky to get it really uh, uh, straightforward in a, in a safe and quite reproducible manner. So with the femtosecond laser, you just can perform decimatorexis in size from three, four, five microns uh, in diameter. That's really nice. Studies going on this, and uh, last but not least, CARES and lenticular implantation. You know that uh, keratoconus and ectasia treatment is very difficult. We want to enhance thickness in the uh, stromal area, maybe for after aftercare uh, treatment with excimer laser regulation uh, or in combination with cross-linking. The advantage is in, uh, in terms of uh, cares that we use uh, human ring segments uh, um, for implanting that in the, in the, in the stromal area. And uh, that can be also easily done with the preparation of the donor rings uh, by the laser, but also the, uh, the, the pocket for the stromal area, also with the laser, with the goal of topic uh, regularization, improved contact lens tolerance, and visual acute improvement. But you hear later on this more from Shady. Uh, another way maybe can be done with the uh, refractive procedures where you get the lenticles from a refractive uh, uh, surgeries like Smile Clear or Smart Sight, where you harvest the lenticles and put them again back into a deceased coronal eye uh, like keratoconus to enhance coronal sickness and uh, to stop disease progression. The limitation on that uh, may be the storage condition and uh, of course the customization. We need uh, nomograms in future to stabilize uh, this disease uh, better uh, and get a better control of the refractive outcome. But that's, uh, that's some new approaches. I think Shady will talk on this more. Uh, very interesting uh, features you can have now at the therapeutic step uh, with the femtosecond laser. So for me, to sum up, the femtosecond laser is a perfect surgical toolbox, not only for refractive, but for only also a therapeutic approach with optimized wound healing conditions, with efficient visual recovery, with increased reproducibility compared to the purely manual techniques. I see the advantage for more lamellar techniques coming more in the future. DLQ with the guided tunnel cares, lenticular extraction implantation, uh, maybe the limiting factors is you have to find the right setting here. It's uh, maybe time consuming. Uh, you need advanced uh, stuff here, doing all these uh, um, preparations and uh, technical stuff. But I uh, uh, have great support here by SEMA. They do, they do a really good job here. And for the future, maybe we have a real-time <coughs> guidance. Sorry. A real-time guidance for that uh, uh, to track and monitor our surgical uh, profile and maybe also some tomographic stuff. I know the Galileo system will be implemented in the in the in topographic uh, analysis for the laser and of course the nomograms. We need standardized nomograms, especially for the implantation of rings and segments to get more out of the refractive uh, uh, results for the patient. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you for the attention. Thank you, Wolfgang, for highlighting the versatility of the Zimmer and laser in general, and specifically in uh, lamellar keratoplasty. So what I'm going to do is basically um, discuss a subset of what Wolfgang uh, uh, basically outlined, and that's uh, corneal allogenic intrasomal ring segments, also known as CARES, and uh, specifically all femto CARES using the Z8. So this is definitely in the realm of therapeutic refractive surgery here. More and more dealing with keratoconus as therapeutic refractive surgery. Now we all know that the PMMA cornea ring segments are great, uh, but they do have complications just like any other procedure and a not so uncommon complication of an otherwise perfect surgery actually is stromal melt. A lot of time it can not be that obvious and you might notice that it's just a linear epithelial defect but little we know unless we have a high definition OCT to see that this uh, little defect goes all the way down to the floor of the cornea ring, almost 400 microns deep. Um, again, we've seen different types of melt, sometimes just a, a diffuse melt 
like for instance in this hexagonal uh, cone ring and a lot of thickening, a whopping thickening over this uh, stromal melt. And that's even worse because the anterior stromal uh, ceiling will keep melting uh, with time. Now, uh, Jesse Abad and AJO have reviewed this, his, this uh, occurrence and they found incremental percentage the more uh, we follow up these patients, up to 7% cumulative risk over 10 years. But this was done with a keratome. We thought our, our uh, results with the SK, which have a better profile, and if all femto, very deep would be better. It wasn't, it was actually 5% in 10 years and it was cumulative. So the more we follow up these patients, the more this uh, number keeps creeping up. So um, again, if there is another complication, even more important, that's intrusion. Intrusion, we see it more in uh, triangular rings because of the, the way they, they point on the decimates, and these patients are typically uh, frequent troubles. So what happens is that in that case, we have full penetration with associated high drops. Uh, the patient was coming with uveitis and, and uh, ocular pain. And of course, we have uh, uh, neovessels that can develop around the cornea ring, especially if they're placed a little bit to the periphery, like a large optical zone. So um, corneal allogenic ring segments were introduced by Susan Jacobs to specifically address these complications induced by PMMA segments. Now, there are multiple advantages for them, and we're going to talk in a minute, but I'm going to show you, roughly speaking, the, the technique how we harvest those rings. So basically, we take a corneal graft, we trefine it. That corneal graft doesn't need to be really healthy. We denude the epithelium and the endothelium anyway, and we cut it with a double, uh, um, double blade trefine, uh, the Jacobs trefine. We cut it in half using super sharp. Now, here is a standard procedure using the LDBZ8 for any corneal ring. So we mark the corneal vertex, we mark the three prongs, uh, uh, this is a award marker by Epsilon. And then uh, once we mark these three prongs, we know exactly what is the corneal vertex and we know how to uh, rotate. So even though you might not be able to see this gentian violet uh, dot uh, on a background of uh, black pupil, as you can see here, the cross uh, section of those three prongs, it's like a cross hair, we can know where the corneal vertex is. We center our ablation, we rotate basically to be uh, parallel to the uh, horizontal uh, uh, ink marks which extend through the applanation area. And then we ended up performing the treatment. We always program a diametrically opposite incision. So not just the, 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 this incision, but we have a diametrically opposite incision because we want to make sure that we can pull through those flaccid segments. Uh, the typical procedure with the Mickey, we, we go in, but what I do differently, the cornea ring segments, is that I use my mechanical dissector, not really to dissect, but to make sure that there are no bridges. These segments, remember, they're like, uh, uh, like spaghetti, they're soft, and I want to make sure they go in very, uh, very easily in there. So once I do that, I make sure there are no bridges. I introduce my segments. I have this technique where I let the corneal ring uh, dry out for about an hour. Uh, so this is like a, a jerky, corneal jerky technique. We just pull it in as easy as you see, as if it's just a, a rigid segment, but it's perfectly pliable. So it follows the, uh, the tunnel as you see. And if need be, you can pull it through uh, using a Sinski and you just massage it to avoid any twisting in the cornea. Now, So basically, back to our case, as you can see here, we explanted the cornea ring, and then uh, this is pre-explantation, that's after explantation. Actually, not much effect from the PMMA cornea ring. It was pretty deep and didn't have much effect. And actually, two months out, uh, there's still a little bit, very minimal edema, and the tunnel is still open, wide open in the anterior chamber. But what I elected to do, actually, is to use exactly the same trajectory of the ring, but now not 400 microns deep, actually 250 microns deep. So that's something that corneal allogenic segments offer, and we can't do with the PMMA, because the PMMA would cause melt. But these are natural, so you can implant them really shallow in the cornea, just on top of the tunnel, and as you can see, that's 250, and the extra per we get from such a shallow implantation actually much more effect, much more arc length shortening and much more epithelial remodeling, which will give the ring much better effect than a PMMA, even though this uh, segment is softer, but because it's higher up and the cornea is much rigid higher up, the effect is much more. Now, how do I know the effect is much more? That was the corneal uh, uh, topography before and after the corneal segment, and that's the topography shortly after the cares. A whopping improvement in topography, in cylinder, in K-Max from 61 to 47, but more importantly, an improvement in the quality of vision and in um, 
the refraction, as you can see, 2080 to 2020 minus. And as you can see here, both from uh, the corneal uh, uh, MTF, it's much better post cares. Now back again to the other complication, the more superficial complication, which is the anterior stroman necrosis. We have published our series comparing explantation of these PMMA segments alone versus exchange with corneal ring segments. It's published in GRS about six months ago. So this is a patient, interestingly, that one eye we had, uh, we had to explant because we didn't at the time perform uh, the cares. And as you can see here, you have an epithelial thickness all the way down to the melted tunnel at 400 microns. So this never, never heals. You're gonna have a defect all the way down to 400 microns. So in that case, we just remove the cornea rings. Now, several, year, several years later, the patient came with the same complication in the other eye. But then we had a lot of experience in certain cases when we exchanged the PMME segments with the case. And as you can see here, uh, you have a first a little herniation where the uh, melting was, but three months out, you can see that this ring integrates with the cornea ring segments. That's why it's important. It integrates and not, not just sit there as a spacer. And as you can see, if you look at the topography in the uh, eye that we just explanted, you can see that the melt pre-op, post-op, uh, sorry, the steepening is now dead in the center with an increase in both uh, K-max, SIM-K, and cylinder. However, with the eye that we just exchanged, as you can see, the very central uh, corneal topography looks pretty good, and actually the SIM-K is uh, less. Now, for primary treatment, as you can see, this is one eye of a patient, and then we implanted uh, a care. So this is a primary treatment, and that's 21 days later, this is the cares, and that's much, much better regularized topography. What is irregular now became very regular astigmatism. That's the other eye of the patient. The patient didn't want to do dog. She wanted to, do, to have mini-scleral contact lenses. So we implanted a cares exactly, interesting enough, exactly the same segment size, but interestingly, depending on the K-max, that's going to behave differently. And as you can see, that's one month and a half out, massive improvement in your K-max and in your... Uh, uh, corneal topography. Now, with all these advantages in mind, I still have a couple of questions as a surgeon regarding the cares. Now, one, it's just more complicated. You have to tree fine, you have to cut. Maybe I would do that, but the general ophthalmologist is to shift from uh, a PMMA segment to, to cares. You need more customization in terms of arc length, thickness, and asymmetrical segments. Two, it needs to be precise and reproducible so that it will have widespread adoption. So what I did, I teamed up with uh, a Zimmer Group and using the anterior chamber, um, uh, artificial anterior chamber, we develop, we are developing a software that basically on the Z8 not just insert the segment, but actually cuts the segment. So like you see here, that's uh, uh, a, a human donor, you uh, basically plan with the OCT exactly the segment size, the arc length, asymmetrical or non-symmetrical, whatever you want, and actually you can create multiple segments of the same cornea. You can go all the way up to four. And as you can see here, it's easy to peel, just with a Sinsky delineate where it is, and just easy to peel. All right, so this is how the PMMA segments look like, and that's how a laser cut corneal uh, uh, cares look like. Very nice, integrate very nicely in the cornea, and that's uh, actually at day one. If you look at the OCT, it's even better. Uh, you look at this very nice profile at OCT, sits very well with the cornea, integrates with the cornea, and that's really, again, very important. So my conclusion and thoughts here is that cares in general are a breakthrough in terms of lamellar keratoplasty, in terms of uh, ring segments. I do believe that they are a promising tool. I do believe that customizing them using the uh, if I'm to second laser like the Z8 will eliminate all the inventory, eliminate all the, the hassle uh, preparing them, and more importantly, these rings integrate with the cornea. You can put them very shallow, you can treat secondary uh, procedures, or you can do them in primary procedures, and their effect are even better than BME. What finally we need is a better nomogram. So we, have, we need to have more cases, established nomogram more and more so that we build confidence for um, the rest of the surgeons. Thank you.
So basically, again, the next speaker is Dr. Jod Mehta. Dr. Mehta will not be able to be physical with us, but he's online. He'll be able later to answer any Q&A. And he's going to talk about putting sparks in CLIA. So we shift now gear from therapeutic surgeries into refractive surgery. Uh, Professor Mehta. So I'd like to thank uh, Zima for this kind of invitation to talk at the symposium. The title of my talk is going to be Putting Sparks into CLIA. Uh, these are my dis financial disclosures, so of course, I do give talks uh, for Zima. So first-generation lenticular extraction has shown outstanding outcomes with respect to comparison studies uh, to LASIK. We've shown similar levels of safety and efficacy and final visual acuity results. But there is evidence of higher cases of vertical coma, and but definitely less induced uh, spherical collaboration. In this uh, paper on the left-hand side over here, you'll see several publications up until 2017. But in more recent papers uh, published using randomized, randomized control uh, trial designs, you will show almost equivalent results with respect to efficacy and also visual acuity results. But there is large variability in the results in literature, and this is really related to variations in centration and torsion control by the different authors. We know that the induction of cyclotorsion changes when you go from upright to basically a supine position. And this is, results in a mismatch of applied versus intended profile. If you compare pure cyclotorsion mismatch versus that of a decentered ablation, in fact, the cyclotorsion mismatch is much less than the effect of decentration. So centration is still more important than cyclotorsion. We all know that basically the higher the degree of the cell, the, greater, the, the smaller the amount of cyclotorsion has the greater amount of effect. And you can see that from this curves on the right-hand side over here. And certainly there's a difference in predictability with respect to torsion and control when you're doing treatments over 1.5 adopter cell compared to under 1.5 adopter cell. And likewise, the axis of the astigmatism seems to have an effect with respect to the outcome following lenticular extraction as well. Now, when we look at centration, there are several studies basically giving us some ideas about how important centration is. One of our papers back from almost six years ago now basically showed the importance of decentration in patients that had high levels of angle kappa intercepts using a preoperative measurement to give us an idea of where the uh, fixation needs to be of the lenticular creation. Likewise, this paper on the right-hand side by uh, Professor Reinstein's group basically showed that there's, with the greatest degree of pupil offset, i.e. angle kappa, there was a greater the risk of basically inducing vertical coma. If you want to look at this in real terms, it's seen that the breaking point with decentration of the corneal vertex with the reduction of spherical aberration is about 335 microns. We know that also that the tolerance decentration is related to the uh, optical zone of the program lenticule. With smaller optical zones, you need to be basically more accurate. The tolerance is basically less. With larger optical zones, of course, your decentration can be a little bit more, but we have to bear this in mind that you'll be basically using more tissue in order to do the equivalent refractive treatment. If you look at the uh, visual acuity results, however, between the two groups of patients that had less than 0.35 5 millimeter decentration versus more. In fact, the visual acuity is not actually very similar, but where you will basically pick this up is in the uh, aberration. So understanding and looking at your outcomes um, of your aberrations with respect to uh, vertical coma is the key thing, basically, when you're assessing these patients postoperatively. So uh, Dan Ryan's house group in, in London basically proposed a, a technique, basically, where you mark three areas on the cornea, the 0, basically 180, and the first Purkinje to give you an idea to help you with centration. And I think this gives you a good way of knowing that your, uh, your lenticular creation is centered correctly on the vertex of the cornea. I also use this in combination by looking at the angle kappa. There are several machines that can be used. One of them is basically the orb scan. And get, this gives you an idea if a patient has a high angle kappa preoperatively, you may want to decenter your, your lenticular creation prior to basically your docking to give you an improved in, improvement in the uh, visual acuity outcomes. So you can see over these videos over here on the left-hand side why we basically need centration when we're doing standard excimer laser ablation. You can see the movement in the eye, and we know that using trackers, we basically will improve our outcomes following um, excimer laser ablation. There's several publications to basically show this. In the middle, you'll see that using first lenticule uh, extraction procedure, how I need the cooperation of the patient to help me with the centration of the lenticle itself. So you need some verbalization with the patient, and to cooperation, and if I have to decenter, 
the centration itself, there's a risk that I can get suction loss because the cone will be slightly to the edge of the limbus, and there's a higher risk of getting suction loss with a low suction system. On the right-hand side, you can see how we do the torsional alignment after the docking of the, of the cone itself. I'm then rotating the cone itself with the suction on in order to get the alignment in the horizontal axis with that of basically the graticule. So again, there is a, is a risk of basically getting suction loss during the rotation that you can see happening on the video. With clear, this is done slightly differently. After we mark the eye basically on the slit lamp, and there is docking of the laser system, the laser system will automatically assess the areas of the pupil and also the, basically the markings of the cornea itself. This allows you to basically not have minimal cooperation with the patient because or basically the patient just needs to look at the fixation line. And the laser itself will pick up the, basically the markings and then if the surgeon needs to adjust this, they can basically adjust this using these handles as you can see on the screen in order to make sure that the centration is basically accurately centered and also you've got basically psychotorsion control. So it basically takes that away from having the subjective effect that you have with the patients and have it done much more automated, done by the basically the surgeon and the technician and also it allows you to do it under suction which means that there's no risk of basically getting suction during this kind of adjustment. So this current technique is basically what we call semi-automated. So it still requires a surgeon to mark basically both for the centration point and basically the torsional point, as I showed you on the pictures earlier. It still requires a technician or, and the surgeon to adjust the lenticle position or rotation. This is improved with newer software versions where it's done a bit more automatically, but there still may be some adjustment uh, to be done. And this is a potential uh, form of error as well. But you need minimal cooperation to basically do this, and there's minimal risk of suction loss because the suction pressure is higher uh, during the creation of the lenticle itself. But the question is, can we eliminate this error completely? So I'm going to show you a new concept that's basically the SEMA workflow concept. And this is basically made up of three parts. One is basically taking imaging acquisition using the Galilee on the left-hand side, and this is your pre-operative screening tool. The information from the imaging is basically sent basically to Zima workflow where planning basically can be done. Then from the planning on the workflow system, it's then basically sent to the femtosecond laser. And this allows integration between the preoperative uh, tomography uh, result into basically the planning stage and then back out to the, to the laser system itself. And we have to bear in mind and not underestimate the effect of human error in basically causing morbidity in patients. And in fact, it's the third most common cause of medical morbidity in the United States. So this is how we can see basically how it works. So you have the uh, topography system on the left-hand side over here. So this is the Galilee for the basic patient management. Information can be sent from the galley system into the server and then into the workflow, but it can also basically go from the workflow into basically the galley system as well. In the workflow system itself, you can check your data from the galley system, and then you can do your planning basically what you of the treatment that you want to basically initiate on the patient with the femtosecond laser. This is then sent down to the basic femtosecond laser where the information is basically imported uh, from the work list you can basically put all the planning information on into the laser system itself and import all your basically uh, laser planning parameters as well. And the idea is it eliminates transcription errors, it improves the planning workflow because this can be done on the workflow station itself. And of course, we want to see an improvement in surgical outcome because we're minimizing the risk associated with our preoperative planning for the patient as well. But the big advantage is it allows you to use the information from the tomography unit to allow you to center your laser ablation profile on the visual axis to allow automatic centration and automatic cyclo rotation compensation. So we'll show you basically how this works. On the left hand side you'll see the work flow system in the top left over here to give you an idea of where these images are basically captured from. So first you basically go to the Galilee system itself and this is the color imaging photograph that's obtained from the Galilee. So if you look at the examination stage over here, you will see the cyclo rotation score and the compensation basically taken from this image over here. On the right hand side, you'll see the other information that is also available on the Galilee system, in use, including the angle kappa, um, as well as basically the, uh, the positioning of the corneal vertex. This information is then sent to the workflow system, and here you can basically do your programming of lasers, so the usual information that you want for programming, the refraction area that you're going to program, the uh, incision positions, uh, either one or basically two incisions as well, the keratometry data, 
uh, and also the um, correction factor that you're basically adding uh, to your programming of your treatment, uh, both for the left and also basically for the right eye. So you can see here that this is the right eye blood screen, and you can see a summary of the left eye treatment on the left-hand side. This information is then sent to the femtosecond laser, so most of you will be familiar with this if you're doing basically clear now. This is the standard basically screen on the um, clear uh, module on the femtosecond laser, and this information has come, however, not from the programming of laser, but from the Zima workflow system. The way that basically the cyclotorsion torsion system will work is it will then use that color image from the uh, Galilei system and then compare it with the image taken from underneath the feminine second laser. And here you'll get an automatic uh, cyclorotation rotation control uh, of the image from looking at the iris features uh, from the color photograph versus what we're basically seeing um, for underneath the feminine second laser. For the centration control, it's taking the first Purkinje image on the corneal vertex from the Galilei system. And again, that information is transported through the workflow system into the femtosecond laser to allow you to get a perfect centration of your lentical creation in the correct position. So in conclusion, in order to reduce the variation in visual results with first generation lentical extraction, it is important to have good centration and torsional control. The first generation procedures are really too subjective and that's why you see a large variation in outcome. The current technique is better. There's no risk of basically suction loss. There's no need for any cooperation uh, with the patient, but there is still some possibility of human error because you need to mark the patient on the sit lamp and then you need to do some sort of minor adjustment. The new SEMA workflow will reduce this basically human error. It allows pre-operative detailed planning of the procedure in your own time. There is no link to the internet for the server, so there's no data security issues. And, in, and integrating the imaging information to the laser allows for fully automated centration on the visual axis and automatic torsional control. And really what we want to achieve for all our patients, like this example of one of my patients on the right-hand side over here, what we want to achieve is a perfect lenticule creation profile where we have perfect centration and minimal induction of any spherical aberration or vertical coma, but for every treatment that is performed with the laser. Thank you for your attention. So thank you, Professor Meta, for these uh, nice tips and nice addition to the clear lenticular extraction procedure. The last speaker, and not the least, is Dr. Arturo Shayat from Mexico, who's going to speak about the clinical experience in clear. Again, Dr. Shayat could not make it, but we're going to hear uh, the recording. And thank you to the Simmer Group for uh, inviting me to present on our initial experience with CLEAR. I would like to thank my uh, co-authors, Dr. Pincus, Robledo, Valdez, and Navas, who helped us for this presentation. CLEAR stands for Corneal Lenticle Extraction for Advanced Refractive Correction and is in the kind of procedures of lenticle extraction similar to SMILE. CLEAR is uh, being uh, done using the femtosecond LDB-C8 from Zimmer, and one of the main uh, characteristics of this uh, laser for CLEAR is the ability to do centration and rotation and do all these adjustments on the screen under active suction. We started to do CLEAR in January of 2020 and until now we have done 156 eyes uh, using five different clinical sessions uh, for which we did in all of them some nomogram adjustments to improve uh, every time the results. The surgical technique that we use is at the slit lamp we marked uh, at 0, 180 and 270 degrees to have a precise uh, uh, alignment during the uh, treatment. We marked the, uh, under the microscope the first Purkinje reflex and then we would use two-step two docking as we found that it's uh, better, easier and more precise as well. The centration and rotation adjustments are done while the suction is on and then the delineation of the anterior edge in the first incision is done to find uh, the different planes. The dissection of the anterior plane and then the posterior plane is done with a special spatula and then the removal of the lenticle. 
Let me show you here a video uh, in two steps. First, the first step is the uh, ZA lamellar dissection. We're seeing here the after the docking, we are uh, having the suction on, and now we're doing the centration to make sure that everything is well aligned, well centered. And once we are happy, we start with the uh, uh, femtosecond treatments of both planes, the posterior plane and the anterior plane. And you can see there's some venting uh, incisions there and then the incisions for the entry of the dissectors. In this uh, part of the video, we are going to show how we First of all, we will find the anterior plane. You can see there, we're just behind the... Uh, and then now we're going to be behind the, la the, the lenticle, that's the posterior plane. And now again, being anterior to the lenticle, we're going to do the dissection of the anterior uh, lamella. We're going all the way to the periphery and you can notice how smooth the dissection is, is effortless. Now we are in the posterior plane. Again, going uh, from one side to the other, going to the periphery, and you will see uh, how easy it is to remove the lenticle, as you can see here. So I didn't have any experience doing SMILE. My first uh, lenticle extraction was with clear uh, in January of 2020 and until now we have uh, as I mentioned we have done 156 uh, cases and it, those cases were done through 156 attempts in other words we have never had any issues any complications it's been successful in all 100% all, all, uh, of the time uh, we have used different surgeons Myself, Dr. Pincus, uh, who was the most experienced smile uh, surgeon in our place, and then three fellows, three different fellows, have been also being able to, to do the clear procedure, and in all cases, this has been very successful. So let me show you some results. Uh, this is, these are results of nine patients, 17 nights of procedures done last December, 2000. Uh, 2021. Uh, these uh, procedures were done after adjustments to the nomogram and te technical settings and all, all eyes were done at, at our place. Uh, we included eyes with myopia of at least 2.5 diopters and cylinder up to 2.5 diopters. And here we see the demographics, patients around 27 years of age a sphere between minus 3 to minus 5 and cylinder up to 2 diopters. In terms of the uh, safety and efficacy, we can see here that the cumulative snell and visual acuity, 76% of the eye had 20, 20 or better, so it, uh, preparatively, and 71% of the eye achieved 20, 20 uh, postoperatively. Out of those, as we, if we consider from those eyes the ones who have uh, the best corrected visual acuity before surgery, we found that 76% of the eye had the same uncorrected visual acuity compared to the best corrected visual acuity. So this is more or less the ballpark of where are we in terms of uh, uncorrected visual acuity, 76%. 2020 or better. In terms of safety, uh, none of the eyes lost two or more lines of uh, best corrected visual acuity. Only one eye lost one line of best corrected visual acuity at three months. And 47% of the eyes actually gained one line of best corrected visual acuity. Uh, the accuracy, as you can see here, most eyes were within half diopter. We can see here that 88% of the eyes were uh, landed within half diopter of a metropia, and uh, all the eyes were within one diopter of a metropia. The stability, excellent, with a little bit of uh, overcorrection at the one week, but then nicely uh, goes to basically plano, 
at the three month follow up with very little uh, uh, regression of the effect. In terms of the refractive astigmatism, 94% uh, of the eye ended up with less than half diopter of cylinder and all the eyes ended up with less than one diopter of cylinder. Uh, the target induced astigmatism versus surgical induced astigmatism, as you can see here, very nice, very tight. The same thing we can say for the refractive astigmatism angle error with a none of the eyes with more than 15 degrees of rotation. So in conclusion, we can uh, say that CLEAR is a new uh, promising alternative for refractive lenticle extraction, appears to be safe and effective for the treatment of myopia and myopic astigmatism. Adjustments on the nomogram and technical settings are giving better results. Uh, by now, we've done an extra clinical uh, study uh, early this year and the results are coming up and I just talked today to my fellows and uh, most of the eyes are 2020 or better and many eyes are actually at six months uh, uh, 2015 or better so uh, this is very uh, encouraging we will uh, present and we will uh, uh, publish in the next future a larger series of patients with longer follow-ups and so we look forward for all this uh, information coming up soon. So thank you very much for your attention. Uh, I'll be more than happy to uh, address any questions or any comments in the future. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Shayat. For the interest of time, because we are already past the limit, uh, we will uh, just limit the questions to one or two if anybody has any question. Okay, that's great. So this concludes our symposium. I would like to thank you for attending. I would like to thank the speakers for their time and effort. Thank you so much.